everyone. It is another edition of This Is Whole Life. It's a special edition. And even though... It's a special edition. It's a special edition. And I'll tell you why. Okay. I'll tell you why. Last week, we're going to start with a little hype. We're going to start with nothing else at first. We're going to start with a little hype. Because I got to meet Brittany in person at church during first service. I was kind of out doing my thing, talking to people. And she's like, Randy. And I'm like, yes, but I don't know you. <laughs> And she said, <laughs> Brittany. And I'm like, oh, I owe you an email. She's like, yes, you do. Guess what? 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 Brittany's been listening. She finally caught up with episode 400 and now she's back. You know, she, she's right. on course. But what she's been missing, what, what's one thing that Ken would really hope that nobody listening was missing, missing right now? Something we started this year that Ken, it was Ken's idea. Oh, the game? Yeah. She's like, how do I get into this game I keep hearing about? Mm. So being the good... Um, player of the game. The player of are. the game. Yeah. Right. And listening to the game master. Right. Uh, Brittany is now the proud owner of a... Connected t-shirt. A connected t-shirt. Connect, connect, connect t-shirt. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Welcome, Brittany. Brittany, she's playing the game and I can't re I can't reveal her... Game tag because no, we, we, no, no, no. I, I tried to no, help that's, her though. That's a secret. That's, well, that's hard that's though. For important. some people, that's well, really hard to come up fine, with. That's fine, but you know, yeah, no, the I, harder it was, you don't want her to have to change it later now because yeah, no. you gave it away. I mean, no. you all have your <laughs> secret spy secret. name. You give that up, you know, you could be found out. And that's that's problematic. So, if you two are wondering what we're talking about, what's the best way? You could just you could just send an email. Right? You send an email to Randy or the podcast, and I yeah. let I I will allow at this point if you send an email to to Randy going, what is this game that every that you mm. guys are talking about? I will allow Randy. We're far enough in the year at this point that I okay. will allow him to send you back a instructions. Link, a link. I'll just actually just a link. Just to, do the link. Just a link to yeah. where you need to go to to figure this to out. To get this out. Okay. But what is it? It's like uh, it's whole life dot church slash, slash connect, connect the game, game sign up. Sign up. Connect That's the right. game. It's a long up. one. We should have rethought that. But, one, but or you can just email us and we'll give you <laughs> the link. <laughs> but yes, yes. Email us and get the link. So Brittany, uh, she had lots of compliments. And Ken, it's a good looking t-shirt. It is a good looking t-shirt. Only one way to get it too. It's the only way to get it. Like I had a, I was just thinking this morning, we have a new staff member right. that uh, came on board today. Does not have one. And does not have, I thought, I thought about putting it in the um, little goodie package of little gifts that we're giving her as we're getting started. I said, no, she didn't earn it. That's right. <laughs> See, Brittany, I you was gotta not- earn. You got to earn it. I like my own family or like my kids are at college and in high school away and they're like, come on, dad. And I'm like, no, you got to show up. And that's not, it's just the way it is. <laughs> Brittany, did I tell you? Huh? Was I kidding? No. We take this real serious. Having right? fun is serious business. It is. You got to <gasps> And did you just? You got to have rules. You did you hear that? Rules. Did you hear that, folks? Guess who's back? It's Melanie. Yay! She's back. <laughs> <laughs> Although last week, uh, Brittany, I was. She gave. Uh, she's like, you and Ken do a great job. So I was like, hey. Aw, thanks, Brittany. Right? I was yeah. like, well, thank you for making us feel good about ourselves while Melanie was It doesn't gone. get you any more t-shirts, but we appreciate <laughs> yeah, it very right. much. Yeah. Give yourself an extra 500 points yeah. for oh, Game Master. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was not the real Game Master speaking. You may not do so, but, but I will allow 50 points. So. Oh, wow. An extra 50. Get caught up in a hurry. So, what? yeah. send. A, well, that's email. a good point. She just started, didn't she? Yeah. Give yourself 100 points, Brittany. <laughs> oh, 100. 100. See, the Game Master is getting soft now. Here we yeah. go. Here we yeah. go. Well, I didn't listen to the podcast, but I have spies everywhere who did listen to the podcast, and they they concurred with they Brittany. Concurred. That, ah. that you all, and I heard I got an honorable mention, or maybe a dishonorable mention. I don't know. I got a mention. What, you did what get I, a mention. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Ken, thanks Ken, for thinking about it. I was just going to let everybody <laughs> hang out there and figure out, like, see, like, guess why Melanie's not here? And Ken was like, no, no, no. I think we should tell him. And I'm like, no. And he's like, yeah, yeah, we should tell him. Like, I find. Especially the way he said it. <laughs> the way Randy said it made well, it. Like, I'm like, no, she's not in prison. Uh, she's not. <laughs> I she just, hasn't been fired. She's not on timeout. Yeah. Well, I just like to let people's imagination go for a little bit. And then yeah. I assume I'm going to get an email like, what happened to Pastor Melanie? 
I mean, that, that, that would have been a fun sort of game that could have happened. But what do you think happened? Oh, and it happened it's right funny. after that episode. It's funny where until she it's said not fun. This. Do you see why we miss Melanie? Look at those exactly. good ideas right there. I mean, that was a couple of hundred extra points for this game. Yeah. All right. So this week, uh, I'm Randy, by the way. Melanie Bachman to my left. That would be Ken me. Wetmore to our right. Randy, you're the communication <sighs> director for the for the you know whole life church and Ken's lead pastor. Yeah, yeah. Melanie's worship pastor. pastor. Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah. Now you so, know who we are. Yeah. And if you've been following along, you know that we are in the middle of this making the connection series. Yeah. And connecting across. Now every week. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about some. We pick which landmine Ken's going to step on this week. <laughs> and what could go wrong? What could go wrong? Literally, talk about religion. I mean, that's wow. not a problem. And so it, it just. I guess know, I didn't it, do politics, did yeah, I? Yeah, I was going to say oh, politics the most got left out the off, off the list. How did that? Like, how did that one? Did we? Did we kind of connect that to anything? I think we. I think we're going to talk a little bit about that during election season. Uh, oh, I think mm-hmm. probably so, in October. A few more landmines yet to come then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Talk about it a little bit more. But, you know. But that's actually going to be fun. I'm actually tying that into a series on the book of Daniel. Ooh. Yeah, well, that sounds fun. ominous. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Daniel. I mean, well, Daniel in Revelation is always like. You're always oh, doubting me on these gloom. things. But we no, had no. so much fun with Revelation. We though, did. We? Okay, we did. So and, Daniel's going to be and, fun and, too. Exactly. I'm sure it will be. I just, you know, like Revelation, I like I said before, I, I knew very little about Revelation. So for me, I'm a little apprehensive because I'm not sure like when, you know, when horns and things you're supposed to duck or jive or move <laughs> to the side. I don't know those things. And you got, you know, so it, you have to you have to bear in mind that you have a, a rookie over here. When okay, you've convinced Revelation. me it's time for another series on <laughs> the book of Revelation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I guess the, ch- the, the churches weren't quite enough. <laughs> no, they're not. We'll see. Then the churches, but, but I didn't know churches weren't connected to those things. But I think uh, actually uh, just shout out to Randy Roberts out at Loma Linda University. Church. I I have not listened to his series, but I think he just got done with a seven part series on the Book of Revelation, yeah. and I've heard people that I trust that said it was a really good series. And, so. and I know Randy, and he's amazing. Just a, I, okay. I'm lucky enough that once a year I get to hang out with him for a couple days, and just he's brilliant. And so yeah. Excellent. So if you want to hear more about the Book of Daniel from somebody that I I highly Endorse, even though I haven't heard the series, so maybe I better be Wait, careful. Daniel but... or Revelation? Oh, did I say Daniel? I meant Revelation. Revelation. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, so I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. So this week, I mean, we've talked about money, we've talked about socioeconomics, we've talked about all these all these different traps that we can get caught in. And this week, when it was religious <laughs> beliefs, I was like, well, you know, maybe other than politics, maybe there's not a bigger landmine. And then Ken just oh, I can think of one other, but we'll leave it. Well, there. maybe. Well. Yeah, maybe. Well, anyway, Ken came out swinging, and I just had to. I, I, the story. I mean, he was not wrong when he said some of you are not following where this story is going. <laughs> because I were was you like, one of those that went, no, you, didn't, you, you I had was no idea? Where, oh, because I was just like, I felt like I was the only one in the front row going, oh, yeah. like, like this is where this one's going, and uh, so. Uh, be careful on Wednesdays. Yeah. Uh, because apparently that's a good day to put your foot in your mouth. Yeah. Um, and- <laughs> Unless you're me and every day is a good day. <laughs> well, touche, me too. But Ken, it, it was obviously an unlucky day for Ken. And some, it, it just, your story was so spot on because most of the times I feel like we're not out to intentionally poke the bear with anyone. And maybe it's because we don't know what their beliefs are. Yeah, that's so it. you know we just don't know what the practices are. We don't know what the beliefs are. And, and the funny thing is that we all assume that everybody else understands, understands our belief <laughs> system too. It's yeah. like that is that is the, so. You know we don't know, but we expect that everybody. Well, everybody's familiar with what Seventh yeah. Day Adventists believe. I mean, I I'm very familiar <laughs> with it. So why wouldn't everybody else? Well, how can you read the Bible and not understand it? I mean, it's pretty clear. Exactly. Oh, right. It's so just like crystal. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I I it just went as soon as he started saying, I was like, oh, I know where this is going. I can. I grew up in a very Catholic community. Yeah. The whole like the state of Wisconsin, early 1970s was very very predominantly by like 90% type Catholic. So all the, you know, there was Catholic churches everywhere. All, all your friends that weren't Adventist were 
probably Catholic. And so it wasn't like we didn't. Yeah, just weren't the opposite. Fam- weren't familiar with those things. Yeah, and just then the in opposite Ken's for case, me. I think there was one Catholic church in wow. the entire county. And um, I, I don't know that they, I don't know how many people they had, but it was like, I grew up in Baptist country. I oh, okay. Mean, big time, ba- Southern Baptist country, you know, Baptist church on every corner. And then I then, so very Protestant area. And then, you know, then I grew up in this very cloistered, uh, Seventh Day Adventist community as well. You know, I, I you know, <laughs> just no friends that weren't Seventh Day Adventist that I can remember. Um, you know, until I think the first time I had any education with somebody who wasn't a Seventh Day Adventist, I think was um, when I was having to take driver's ed. And, oh wow! Yeah, and that was we did that short foray because it was free. Um, and my parents, <laughs> if there's anything an Adventist likes, it's something that's it's free. free. We're willing to go ahead and. <laughs> Wow, so that's, anyway, a big, that's a big brush you just painted yeah. us all with, but also not wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was going to say, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but, uh, no, but I, I, I'm just talking about the community I grew up in. That's all I'm trying to say. Oh, man. So well, anyway, so yeah, so I, I had no idea. None. Well, we and we grew up with, like, the kids in our, I say neighborhood, there were, what, four other houses that had kids under, or people in that house under 21, in uh, two cornfields, that met, basically four cornfields that met at the corner hmm. and went on a dead end street in the middle of nowhere. So, but like they thought it was weird on Wednesdays was the weird day. So maybe this is, maybe this is a thing hmm. because on Wednesdays we had pathfinders. Oh yeah. So we would have to leave. So they would leave at like three o'clock. What is pathfinders just for those who might be tuning in and are uh, maybe Catholic think, and don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> think boy scouts of America. So think about of, boy scouts and girls Girl scouts, that, uh, kind of co-ed type of thing. Yeah. yeah I think we're the only ones that do it that way. Seems like I don't know. I don't think anyone else is co-ed. Uh, I think I want it. I think Iwan is, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. So we would have to go to our Pathfinder meeting on Wednesday night. We'd have to leave like six o'clock. So our friends are like, whoa, you know, even in um, summer, like, where are you going? Like, oh, I got to go to Pathfinders. Which Pathfinders? And then obviously yeah. give the explanation. For them, they would leave school and they wouldn't because the problem was they would go from school to catechism. Mm-hmm. which was an after-school activity, Bible study yeah. that the Catholics do. And so they would all have to go to catechism. They wouldn't get home until then, of course, their parents could pick them up. So they would be getting home about the time we would have to leave. And it's like Wednesday was shot for plays. Like yeah. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't ride your bikes. You couldn't go play baseball. You couldn't do anything on Wednesday nights because everybody was busy. So that was that. There you go. So I think we kind of had an idea. And we had seen- And you that, know why they had Pathfinders on Wednesday nights in your town, right? They probably had to counteract. No, no, no. No, 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 why, no, why, why, why on Wednesday? It's because it, you, because all the adults were having I mean, prayer, prayer meeting upstairs. Yeah. That's true. There that's true. That's what it was. Yeah, you're probably- So uh, they did that to keep the kids busy while they were having prayer meeting. And that way your parents didn't have to drive all the way to town and exactly. back, and then all the way to there town and, and back. And that's the real reason for Pathfinders. So that's right. <laughs> Or, or prayer meetings. At least where I grew up. We're not here because yeah. we have a, a whole life has an amazing Pathfinder club and we don't yeah. meet and on they, Wednesdays. they don't do Wednesdays. Uh, yeah, they yeah. Do. They, no. do, they do lots of days. Parents in the in the North would revolt. It's like you're you're interrupting lay activities so that would not, you can't have Pathfinders on Saturday afternoon after church for going home. Yeah, I can think to of sleep. other reasons too, but anyway. Well, there's lots of reasons probably for someone. I don't know. But... So for me, I was like, oh, man, I can see Ken is just like, I know where he's going with this. Just getting ready to wipe the ash from Ash <sighs> Wednesday off of a, mm. off of one of the faithful's foreheads. It, that's, mm. uh, now, I, I will admit, even growing up in that, I knew what Ash Wednesday was. And I because you would see it on Ash Wednesday, no matter where you went, if you were outside in the community, you would see somebody mm-hmm. with the ash cross on their forehead just walking around so everybody knew what it was but i don't know if i know what's that i mean what's it symbolic of like what's it mean i don't know i don't i don't know i've never like looked it up and said hey what's what is ash wednesday yeah it's the beginning of as we as we're moving into the passion of christ and into the, his sufferings and so on and so forth so on sunday you have palm sunday right right yep so that's where jesus triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Um, and so at least on Guam, I can't speak for other places and not being Catholic, I don't I don't know. But at least on Guam, um, they would have a big 
a big celebration on uh, Palm Sunday at the churches, and they would have palms, palm palm branches that they would wave, and there there was it was a big thing, like the and, triumphant entry. Yeah, into Jerusalem. exactly. Gotcha. And so what they would do is they would take all those palm branches that they cut down, and they would wait a day or two, and then on Tuesday they would burn the 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 palm branches, and they would take the ash from hmm. from that and then mix it with water, and that's what you used on palm. Or I'm pardoning me on Ash Wednesday to um, put the sign of the cross on uh, adherents' foreheads, right? And um, and so you know it, it's it's a part of symbolizing taking on that suffering of Christ, you know, and and you know sometimes the glory turns to ashes. So there's some there's there's some of that playing out in all of that. And again, I I am the wrong. Um, <laughs> I I don't know enough Catholic theology to. I, I, just enough to embarrass myself, but but the thing is, the, what happened was for those of you who didn't maybe hear the sermon just yet. Um, I tried to wipe the ash off of my buddy who is a devout Catholic, and on Guam, ninety five percent of the island is Catholic, and so I tried to wipe the ash off his forehead on Ash Wednesday because I didn't. I I thought he just had dirt on his forehead, and he was pretty upset. Fortunately, I didn't didn't get at it. He smacked he my hand in time. Before. But basically what he, what Mike said to me is he said, well, I, I get up really early. Like, I think he got up at 3.30 or 4 a.m. Oh, yeah, to be yeah. at, at the church early because apparently the earlier you get there, the better the ash is because, you know, early on there's there's plenty of it. And so the, the priest will put a nice, you know, smear there with the sign of the cross but as the day goes by and they start running out of ash, they have to add more and more water to it. So now you have more of a watery. Then it really does look like maybe just you just have some dirt on it. I I should have known. I mean, it was it was a nice thick. So um, this was important to Mike yeah, that he got super there important. early. Oh yeah, super. He wanted the good ash. Yeah. I, he goes, I did not get up early, so you can take that off. <laughs> so <laughs> wow. anyway, so yeah, it was uh, definitely um, I learned something that day. Man, do you think there's anything? About, it was just, I mean, I'm sure there is, but what do you think the, like the equivalent would be to Adventism? I mean, not that there, I don't think we do anything specifically. I will tell outward, you the one that, that people what, absolutely do not get is foot washing. Hmm. Yeah. Like if you have somebody who is not Seventh-day Adventist and comes to a Seventh-day Adventist church on a communion Sabbath, the communion doesn't weird them out because that's kind of an, a normal know, part of most yeah. of Christianity. But what will really s- take people by surprise, and, and honestly, there's plenty of Adventists who I know specifically won't show up if they <laughs> think that they're going to be required to do foot washing, which to me, I I understand where that's coming from, but sure. I also wish that that's part of, for me, the beauty of that particular yeah. symbolism. But I also, I grew up with it and I love the symbolism. It means something to me. Um, but for people who aren't, it's just a really weird ritual that why would anybody touch anybody's feet? feet yeah. Um, why would, you know, where is that coming from? Because that's just not something that's really widely practiced. The thing I liked about that, just as a side, going back to my childhood, which I always was like, that's kind of weird too. Yeah. And, you know, the eating the the bread and the, the wine and the body and the blood. And as a kid, maybe it's a little bit above what we're, what we, what we can handle. But I always thought it was a cool thing for foot washing because people that you didn't get to see, I wasn't like here at whole life where you just, I mean, people are working and, and, Pitching in and volunteering like in a really big way, but in a, in a, in a more old fashioned church. I mean, yes, you have your deacons that pick up the offering. You've got your, but they're kind of in the background. You you kind of know who they are. But here was like you know you would see the men rolling up their sleeves, you know, taking yeah. the tie off, taking the jacket off, and people that you only ever saw at church as this person with a suit on. Even the mm. pastor would you know get down and dirty, and and I just always thought that was kind of cool because to yeah. me it felt like. Oh, we're we're kind of taking off the the armor, and this is who the real person is in this whole thing. I always thought that part was kind of cool, even though I did think the foot well, I love washing because it it's just it's the essence of Christ. It's no, this yeah. servant, I like it doing gross things type of thing. It's you know it that Christ was never Christ was not ashamed to get in and do things that were not pleasant, yeah. that were that needed to be done, and 
anyway, so there's just a lot of beauty to me in celebrating that. Our family likes to do it together. It's a kind mm-hmm. of a cool, cool tradition that we've that we've done. All right, so I think we could probably go into the um, forty or fifty ways to most easily offend those that are not of our faith. Oh yeah, <laughs> and tell, no shortage. <laughs> and tell more stories. But what I want to do with the time that we have, because we had a lot of questions and comments, and a lot of really good questions that I want to get to, and then if there's anything we haven't covered before we have to move out today, then we'll we'll come we'll circle back mm-hmm. to, and, and go around. Um, Asking wants to know, if God is God and therefore beyond our understanding, how can we hold our beliefs humbly, realizing no one has it fully right, and every faith may have some insight? Yeah, I was hoping that that was something that someone might ask. somebody might ask. And it was, it was one of the, um, I don't know how many people caught it, but one of the things we were talking about is that if you believe that truth is a person, and that person, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, yeah. and the life. If you believe Jesus' words as a Christian, then truth isn't just a static set of do this, do this, don't do this, don't do that. Truth is a person. And when we look at um, when we look at truth as being a bullet point list of things, it becomes very one-dimensional. And so that means that only one... Bu- you know, only one denomination, only one religion can have it have anything because we we've got this. Whereas if you start looking at truth as a person, you can recognize that there. Are, you know, my wife probably knows me better at this point in my life than my parents do. But my parents know things about me that my wife doesn't know. My kids know things about me that I think that maybe would be a different viewpoint than my wife has. And there are okay. things, Randy, that you you work with me every day. There are things about me that, that you see about me that maybe my wife and my parents wouldn't see. Now, obviously, I would say that my wife knows me better than anybody. So that's probably the first place you'd want to go if you wanted to know more about me. Sure, yeah. But that doesn't mean that you couldn't learn something from Randy, who knows me maybe a little less than my parents and my wife and my kids, but you see a wor- work aspect of me. And so if you start understanding that, looking at God that way, what that means is that there are other religions that may may not, from my perspective, have as much understanding of who God is and what God wants, but they do see an aspect of God that maybe sometimes we may not see as clearly um, from where they're, where they're at. And so if that's the case, then it doesn't do anything to diminish I'm happy with my faith and doesn't mean I want to go find another faith, but it does mean that maybe I can be humble and say, maybe I can learn something. And I think that the Magi that we talked about back at Christmas time are a great example of this. You know, the, the um, Jewish religious leaders completely blew them off when they showed up in town. I mean, what could these pagans possibly have to teach us about the coming of the Messiah? I mean, what are they, I mean, what, what could they possibly, I mean, yeah, there's a King. Yeah, this is the right time, but they're not going to tell us anything. And I think that sometimes um, in Christianity, in Seventh-day Adventism, we tend to blow things off and be like, what could that person ever teach me about God? I've got, we've got, we have the truth. Um, sure. Well, sure, you have the truth as it is in Jesus. Uh, you have Jesus, but that doesn't mean there aren't things you can't learn. You know, one of the best things that ever happened to me was going to an ecumenical seminary where I was attending class with a lot of people from a lot of different denominations. And then uh, going to Vanderbilt, where I had students in my classes who were, you know, who are atheist or, you know, Jewish or Muslim. And uh, one of the things that I I think that I learned was when when you spend a lot of time in a bubble and you're part of the in-group, then there's also a definition that you give to different out-groups. And uh, what I found out was that some of the definitions and some of the things that I learned to believe about what I thought other people believed were actually um, not accurate. So when I when what? I got I know shocking <laughs> I don't know if I believe this. <laughs> so so when I found myself in in you know classrooms with people and having these deep theological discussions and understanding oh that's why you believe that it's not anything like I, why, you know, what I thought about what you believed. So that was a great, that was a great experience. And that's, that's actually where I first also encountered, um, someone with ash on their forehead. (laughs) And actually that's, it's not just a Catholic thing. There are Protestant denominations that do it as well. And it, and it also marks the first day of Lent. 
Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Because then it's, well, Wisconsin, that's a huge thing. Because like Friday fish fries is like a big <laughs> deal. No. And people like start Lent, like, well, all right, we're, we're going, yeah. we're starting early. And I, I remember that. We're now. sacrificing this, this particular thing for yeah. this period of time. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I think I think that is one of the. It's it's really easy to win a theological argument when you're fighting from the same viewpoint with the other. You know, we'll do this sometimes. We're like, why do why do we believe this? And you have that discussion with another person that believes exactly the same thing, mm-hmm. and they they put up a pretty weak fight in defense, even at their best, because they don't really believe it. They're trying to defend something they don't really believe. You start talking to somebody who really genuinely believes something, and you'll you'll learn some things. Mm-hmm. You'll, um, you know, I uh, at Madison Campus Church where I pastored, um, I had a wonderful, wonderful person who attended nearly every week, and he is an Old Testament theologian, brilliant Old Testament theologian. Uh, works for a well recognized organization here within this in the United States. And he was a Baptist pastor and he happened to be married to one of our Seventh day Adventist church members. And he would come and sit in in uh in church and he was lovely. He would often give me some really great feedback and be very positive. And I remember one day I characterized people of his tribe a certain way. And he gently said, hey, could I talk with you later? And we did. He said, you know, here's you said this, but that's not exactly you're not really you're you're misconstruing what we believe in this way. Yeah, you're not 100% wrong, but you're not you're not taking this this and this into account. And um he actually wrote um a um really interesting uh, paper I think for a um for academic journal of some kind um on what happens to a person when they die and he um really tore into adventists and what we believe uh happens to a person when they die and what I loved about him is, you know how humble he was? He sent the paper to me and said, I'd love to hear your feedback on this. Tell me mm. tell me what I'm not getting right. Mm. And we had a great conversation about it. He didn't really change his mind on things, and I didn't really change my mind on things. But you know what? I saw his viewpoint in a very different way than I'd ever seen it before with some of the passages that the way that he chose to exegete those versus an exegete is basically the way you take a text and interpret it. Um, but the way that he did it was very different than the way my Adventist professors had done it. But but I saw where he was coming from, too. It was interesting. Well, and what a great example of the kind of generosity yeah. of, you know, I mean, that was him connecting yep. across with you, yeah. which is a really cool thing. Ray, if you're listening, you're amazing. Great guy. Yeah, that's way helpful. Hey, um... Is it, I'm going to make sure I'm trying to get this name. It's Aracellus, uh, who said, amen, Pastor Ken, nothing is worse than when your own Adventist family is mean to you. Oh, no. That evilness kept me away from coming to church for so long. The Lord gave me the strength to stand up to them with the help and healing I received with the help of Whole Life Church. Hmm. Well, man, I'm glad that in whatever way that was, that yeah. we were able to be helpful. Very happy to hear that, Aracellus. Yeah. And I thought the the other was um, Randy R said, "How do we relate to those within our own faith who believe differently?" Kind of going into that um, the same way. And I wonder if Anonymous answered that by saying, "The first way to begin to respect different forms of spirituality is to learn about them, even if you don't agree with someone's belief or practices. Respect them and love them." And I think that applies to Adventism or whatever your tribe is, because there is such a difference in. Even amongst ourselves, what we believe, yeah, which makes it really difficult. Although really the difficult. difference in what we believe across our denomination is pretty minuscule. I mean, we think we have these big arguments. They're really not that. They're splitting hairs at time. I think. Yeah, I think that there are some big conversations that our denomination needs needs to have That's that true. that are actually kind of big deals. A lot. Yes, I think there are. I think those are not usually the conversations we're having, <laughs> the ones that I think yeah. we wind up, because I think it feels a lot safer to argue about something where we're, you know, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin versus right. what do we do with this particular issue that that could potentially fracture our church. Right. Yeah. Well, those end up being, but those end up being tough ones, especially if someone, the word there of being mean to you and 
you know, that's a lack of respect. That's a lack of empathy. That's a lack of love in general. And that is hard, though, if it, especially if it's someone within your own tribe, maybe your own family that you're having to deal with. That's that's a tough that's tough because that that requires a level of forgiveness that <laughs> I don't think many of us are ready to say, oh, well, that's OK, pumpkin. I totally forgive you for just, you know, mowing me down and then backing up over me and and then calling me a name on your way out the door, which, you know, I think we've all had some degree of that with something we believe or we don't believe or we've had to go through in the past. So that's a that's a tough one. Mm. I don't know that there's any real good other than <laughs> Lord help me be help me not be <laughs> spiteful or hateful and do the best the best I can yeah well <laughs> and that goes it. that uh, this sounds like there are some deeper levels of things happening there in terms of yeah. of like you said respect and relationship that that maybe go beyond just yeah. basic belief differences yeah. that's true okay Aaron wanted to know is the Old Testament fortress a fortress or village model it seems fortress. Was it the Israelites that misinterpreted God's instructions, or was it more fortress because God because God asked it to be that way for their best for their best at the time, or some other reason, or am I misinterpreting it as fortress, and it was actually village? Yeah, I, it, what a great question and a very perceptive one to ask. And and I think that there are times in your life that you want to do things a little bit differently than at other times in your life. For instance, when you have a child between the ages of one and five, that's not the time where I'm going to take them and introduce them to every religion on earth. As a parent, I want to teach them what I believe. That's what I'm going to do. And, sure. and I want to put that there. That's the way I choose to do it. There might be other parents who choose to do something different. But between the ages of one and five, your kid's brain is very malleable. Um, and basically, science has shown over and over that basically the values that you put into somebody between the ages of zero and five are the ones that really stick with them for life. And I know this because my wife has done a lot of research on this as an early childhood educator. And it's it's so when I see Jesus or God bringing the Israelites out of Egypt, I see God bringing a group of people who he was trying to teach some values to, teach some things that were important to him. What becomes interesting is when you start reading through the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, one of the things that they chastise the Israelites for doing is not being a blessing to the nations. And that, that phrase is used quite a bit. And I, I meant you to be a blessing to the nations. Well, what does that mean? I think what it means is that God had always intended for the Israelites to establish a kingdom, if you will, uh, a theocracy that would be a model of what it would look like if you followed God's law and did things God's way, and that it would be such a beautiful thing that it would attract the other hmm. nations to want to have that same experience. And so I, I believe that perhaps there was a, 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 few, you know, a while that God was like, yes, we're going to, there's a learning period here that we've got going on. Sure. Um, but then after that, um, I don't think what tends to happen I believe, is we tend to take kids and we tend to do the same thing ourselves as we never leave the fortress. We never grow up. We're just <laughs> constant children that need to be sheltered and hidden from everything else. And that says something sad about our faith um, because I don't believe, I believe a mature faith can very much go out and have friendships and conversations with people who don't believe the same thing that mm. you do. Yeah. Um, I think it's actually a sign of immaturity to be unable to do that. Um, and that's okay because there are periods where we aren't, you know, children, you know, if you're five years old, you're five years old. That's where your maturity is. But you don't want to stay five years old. And I, I fear that sometimes in Christian in Christianity and Seventh-day Adventism, we stay five. We're like, I'm just, we got to hide. We can't come out. We daren't, we daren't talk about with somebody who believes something different because it might change our minds about things. Well, what does that say? Does it say that we've really taken the time to think through what we believe? Or does it say that, that we're just not particularly tr sure if we have the truth? Sure. And well, it really bugs me. I'll just take this one step. Sorry, Randy. I know you want it. No, no, it go. It really bugs me when when we will have um when we will have leaders 
that will basically say, listen to me, but don't listen to anybody else. Well, what kind of world is that where you say, basically, I can't, I don't trust you enough to listen to anybody but me. It, to me, that, that, that's, that's kind of cult behavior. Well, that's, a, I mean, that's a, that's a sociological thing where if you have, if, if you, <laughs> it's like I've been studying this or something <laughs> where, you know, where, where if you do have an in-group and you're trying to protect the identity of the in-group, one of the ways to do that is to create a dividing line between you and others. And in order to protect the survival of the group, you have to set up those kinds of barriers. But like you said, that's, that's when, you, that's when you are not trusting the people that are in your group. And also, there's another, I mean, what you, what you were talking about in terms of maturity, James Fowler wrote a book called Becoming Adult, Becoming Christian, where he talks about the different stages of faith in relation to adult or human development theory. And it's really interesting because if you look, and, and he, he tries not to hierarchicalize, mm. hierarchicalize there we go, that, that those different stages, but, uh, but we do kind of go from a stage of having to think of things very concretely, very black and white. But then as we mature, we be able, we're, we're able to see some of the nuances and, and we're ev- even able to hold some things in tension. I so think, back oh to my. the barrier thing that, that we, you know, Melanie was talking about, the, 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 that all sounds nice. Let's create a barrier to keep people inside. The, the problem is, is that that barrier keeps other people outside. Yeah. As well. And that's the other problem with it, is that while you're so busy trying to keep a few people inside, you're keeping a lot of people from being a part of that group. And the other part is it just goes against the th- theology that's very important in my understanding of Seventh-day Adventists, and that's the freedom of free will yeah. and the ability for people to make their own choices and to think for themselves. It goes back to the whole whole Reformation where we basically said, look— you don't need a pastor or a priest or a cleric of some kind to interpret the Bible for you. You can do it yourself. Sure. You can look at the Bible and you can decide what God is saying to you. And it it really takes us in a very different direction than the Reformation when we start telling people inside of our churches, no, you just have to listen to those of us who are trained theologians and we'll let you know what God, it's, that's a very different direction than what Protestantism has been. And it, and it's no different doing it as a Seventh-day Adventist than it is as a Catholic or a Baptist. If you're saying, no, 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 listen to the trained professionals, you're moving away from where the Reformation was at. Well, and for the record, I was not recommending that phenomenon. I was just describing. No, no, no. I, I wasn't. I'm sorry if I can't. No, I, I know. I know you were describing it. Yeah, but for I, sure. And I think it demonizes everything that somebody else believes based on, oh, you're this. So Ash Wednesday is dumb, or this this practice is dumb, or Palm Sunday. When in actuality, I mean, thinking about. And remembering the things, it's no different than how someone might look, like you said, foot washing or communion. That's just something that we happen to hold really dear, something that Jesus did. But, I mean, Palm Sunday was, you know, Jesus coming into the to the city, to the palm branches and the and and, and the accolades and, you know, the, doing those. So uh, sometimes I, I feel like we protect ourselves from things that we don't need to that don't need protection from. It, it might be someone else's practice. It may be something that you're not. I, I, I just. I, it's a practice. I don't think it's a theological debate that, you know, someone that's doing X, Y, or Z is necessarily more holy, less holy, or anything else. It's just a practice. And I sometimes I think we just pull those so far over the, because it's a certain group, then it's like, well, that's got to be bad then, of course. Okay. We are almost out of time, but we're almost out of questions. So this is working out pretty well. Um, (laughs) So the one I wanted to get to here is I learned so much from this message. This is Mama Doc speaking. We are not a club. We are a village looking for the coming of Jesus. Other villages also are. Every religion in the past will probably have someone in heaven, and they will probably outnumber the SDAs. There'll be a shaking out. Explain how we can trust less in SDA name and more in Jesus being Christians than being correct. So I think, you know, is it does this go back to we have um, we have sheep in many pastures? Is, is that what we're talking about here, do you think? Well, you know what I, Mama Doc, great point, firstly, fantastic. 
Um, and I love what you said. How can we trust less in the SDA name and more in Jesus? There's only uh, last time I read my Bible. There's only one name under heaven <laughs> yeah. in which we can find salvation. That name is Jesus. Period. Okay. And stop. You know, drop the mic. So, um, so the the first thing is that we put our faith in the the truth as it is in that person in Jesus. Yeah. That, that that is where we put our faith, and then we get to know. Jesus. We get to know God and we there's so many different ways. We we get to know God through the Bible. We get to know God through prayer. We get to know God through um, a variety of other spiritual practices, through nature, uh, through others. Um, and and so th- these are all things I just encourage you to do. I mean, just you know, d- don't search for a denomination. Sh- search for Jesus. Yeah. Search for Jesus and who Jesus is and to know Jesus a little bit better. Again, going back to that analogy all the way at the very beginning, if Jesus is a person, there's always more to know. Always know more. You know, as much as I've been married for 25 years to Rochelle, there's always more to find out about her, more about our relationship that I'm learning about and that I'm trying to grow in. And so the same thing I think is true with Christ. I think that there's just always more to know, more to understand. Well, and I think it's also one one sort of one test that you can give yourself is if you are in a denomination and the denomination believes something or promotes something that you know is not correct or is mm-hmm. wrong. If your allegiance is to the denomination versus whether your allegiance is to what you believe is the truth, yeah. that that can be a good test. Oof, yeah. Yeah. Well, and Anonymous said when connecting across religions or anything, race, economic hurt, all the things we've talked about. God needs to be front and center. Amen. And Mama Doc said at the end, rephrasing, how can we be more loving Christians without compromising the word of God? And I think those two go together because if God is front and center, at least the God that you know, the God that you that you worship, the God that you study the Bible to know more of, that, you know, Jesus to always, you know, always something new to learn, then I think that's to me, that creates a little intrigue than it does, you know, than it does to disconnect. All right, two more really quick. These were from Gabby, whose friends, uh, some friends of hers had been mm. watching okay. and uh, had asked, and she lost her phone at church. It Gabby was, a, was our online host. Uh, yeah. yeah, lost her phone, and she's recollecting these the best that she could because somehow they got deleted in this process. Really okay. weird. Anyway, uh, do I need to be incredibly strong in my faith to have conversations with those of different beliefs? Will I have a harder time with judgment and understanding if my faith is in a rocky place? What well, a good question. Again, I love these questions. It's so good. So here's what I would say. I have found, and for me, my, I, yes, and, um, <laughs> yeah. so what I've found is that my faith has actually grown through these conversations. It's, it's matured at times it's changed. Um, but I think these conversations are really important and you don't, if you're not having them, you're not growing. Yeah. Right. And so I think you need to be discussing and thinking about things. And so what I find a lot of times is that people think, well, I'm just going to wait until I have time to get a, you know, master's of divinity. And then I'll, then I'll be more ready to have this conversation or I'm going to, you know, I want to do this. I want to do that. My encouragement to you is, um, you know, Come start having the conversation. At, you know, we do a we've we've started doing. Uh, I'm just wrapping up a, a series during our Sabbath school time here at Whole Life on Seventh Day Adventist beliefs. I've had some great conversations in there. The people that come don't agree with everything that that sure. I have to share, and that's fantastic. It have been really fun conversations. And what I find is the more of those conversations that I have. The more I understand why I believe what I believe, and I also see why some of the things I believe are really hard for other, other people, people to understand. Yeah. And um, so, my encouragement to you is, um, you know, know what you believe, yeah, and start taking a hard look at it, and then have conversations with other people that are going to challenge you to deepen those beliefs and understanding what you what you believe. Well, and let's take. Let's take the fear out of that judgment word, that judgment word hanging over the top of your head when you're trying to think <laughs> yeah. through these things is not, I don't, I don't think it's, it's helpful. I think that when you, 
when you are out from underneath the fear of judgment, then you have the freedom mm. to be mm-hmm. right. You have the freedom to be wrong. You have the freedom to explore. You have the freedom to grow. And I just don't think that that there's a very fertile place for growth in the shadow of judgment. Mm. Oh, absolutely, man. That's. I, but that's I like good. the way <laughs> I like the way you worded it better. Um, I've often felt that way, and I'll agree with Ken real quick too that that was something that until you have those hard conversations. And for me, it was one of my friends. We both grew. They were they were uh, Catholic, had had become Adventist, and then kind of non denominational. wasn't really sure where they where they fit in, and had some tough conversations where it's like, you know, I just don't I don't believe this. And I know it's what we were taught in you know, grade school and in church and Sabbath school. I just I don't I don't believe it. And I think this is a more accurate portrayal of what God wants from us. And and then when, like Ken said, you, you get that extra picture and you're like, man, I'm not sure. I don't believe that either now. And it doesn't always last forever. Sometimes it's pieces and parts, but then you find something else that's totally unrelated. And then, but it is related. You don't see it until later and you go, wow, I really like, this feels like home to me. Then you feel like this is what God's been trying to tell me through different pieces and people. And if you don't have those conversations, it's only whatever you've heard, whatever you've read in your own understanding, nothing to challenge. Um, Honestly, that's a little boring to me also. Like, I don't feel like there's any challenge whatsoever. All right. This is a final question. We're not going to answer it here because I think Ken did a great job answering it in his message, but I want to get to it real quick. It said, as someone who is a medical professional, I find it difficult to refrain from giving life supportive measures to those who do not want it for religious reasons. I feel like I'm going against my own ethics and beliefs. How do I go about respecting others' beliefs while feeling like I am going against my own? What makes theirs more important than mine? I do want to say something about that because I saw that question. I really wanted to answer it. Okay. Um, So in the particular question that you're asking, what makes theirs more than yours is that you're working on their body, not yours. Ooh, yeah. And that's a huge difference. Um, you're yes, you are a medical practitioner. Yes, you do have a set of ethics. But as a medical practitioner, I know that you're well aware that part of that ethics is respecting the person that you're working on and their choices and the choice that they get to make. I remember one of the more difficult things that I learned just as learning CPR was that if somebody refused me. If somebody said they did not want CPR, or and usually you can't get CPR if you're actually, but if somebody says, if you you notice somebody's in distress and you say, can I help you? And they're like, no, I don't want help. My my instructor told me you wait till they pass out and then you do your, do, do the CPR at that point and you, you're not supposed to do anything to that point. And that's a hard thing to do when you know that you can help somebody and they refuse it. That's a hard thing to do. But particularly when it comes to somebody's religious beliefs, That's a very, you're working with people and their belief and their sense of well-being. Um, You know, I use Jehovah's Witness as an example. I thought that was a great. But, you know, when I talked with the Jehovah's Witnesses that would come in and teach my class their belief systems and what they, so that the class would understand what was going on, you know, they really, for them, it is a massive violation of their personal autonomy to receive a blood transfusion and, and, and the the willingness to receive one means that they're not a Jehovah's Witness because that's what it, that's what the class would be like well but if you know if you received it one you know if you're like I'm dying I'll take it go ahead and give it to me and then go back and say I'm sorry for it and the, they're like no then you're not you're not Jehovah's Witness you that's yeah. you don't do that. Um, they made they considered a very big violation of their personal autonomy, and as hard as that is, I, and like I said, it's one thing when, as a medical professional, you're you're dealing with another person's choice. It's another thing when you're working with a child and their parents are making a choice for them, and you're like, "But that's not. The, I want to give this child blood." They who says that kid doesn't want to live just because mom and dad don't want the child to get the, and this is real stuff that my classes would actually had dealt with. And that's a really hard thing. In a lot of cases, um, that's where, you, that's what you have an ethics board for. That's what you, the people will go to court over this and medical professionals, but there is a system for doing it. And as much as that one bugs me, what doesn't bug me is I don't want people coming and doing things to my kids yeah, that I don't absolutely. want, want mm-hmm. them doing. I don't want, 
that kind of thing happening to my kids. And so if we want freedom, we have to give freedom even. um, But that's again, why we have, I think as flawed as our justice system may be, I think it, one of the good things that it very much good things about it is it does a pretty good job with this of protecting the rights of a child and a parent and trying to figure out how to, because there are cases where the court will intervene and say, no, this is what's going to need to happen for the child. And, and anyway, so as a medical professional, I think it's a really good question because it's a really hard thing to sit there and know that you can help somebody and not be allowed to. That's, it is devastating. Um, you know, I remember hearing about, you know, a mother that was, uh, you know, giving birth, just needed transfusion. That's all she needed to, and she would have been fine. She would have been home the next day. And because of religious beliefs, refused it, died right there. Didn't have to. Uh, Left a baby with a father, no mom. That's difficult as a medical professional. I don't want to gloss over that and act like that's something easy for you to deal with because it's not. Um, At the same time, we're dealing with people's personal freedom and uh, at least within the Western ethic that we have here in the American ethic, it, we just we put a high degree of uh, worth on individual freedoms and people having the right to make decisions, even bad decisions for themselves. I always think to myself, think of one that you hold the most dear, even of any of your religious beliefs. And I mean, obviously, not all those would come into a medical situation, but in any kind of situation that would require you to just say, like you were mentioning, well, it's okay, do it now, but then say, oh, okay, I'm going to go back to the way I was doing it. And when you really stop and think about that, that's a huge, that's a huge deal that you would be able to do that, and especially when, it, and then like you, you, know, you bring the kids into it, and that makes it even more difficult. But I just feel like that's, and, and I'm not a medical professional, so it's hard to hard to speak into that as well, but. Well, Randy, I have to jet here, yes. but I do want to mention Potluck this Potluck. week at Whole Life, where we've got a really special service because we're going to be uh, talking about abilities this week. And we're going to be talking about those who have special abilities, uh, those who, um, you know, th- there's the word disability. Um, we're going to be talking about all these different things and how do we connect across mm. people with uh, a wide range of abilities. So I think you're going to do great on this one. Wow, you're, you're jinxing me now, aren't you? You're like, you're like, well, no, before, I, <laughs> before you're like, oh, you're gonna. So you're like, before you're like, oh, this one's gonna be hard. I don't know how you're gonna do. I wouldn't want to be you doing this one. So now I feel like really scared. Now, 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 it's yeah, just can't, you can't win, can you, Randy? I, I, I was just saying, I just, I, I I've gotten a, I mean, you got a little piece of it ahead of time, though. Yeah, we mentioned in Max and Randy this yeah. past week. We got a little, a little taste of it, and I was just, I'm excited for you guys to hear this message. So we'll be doing that. So we have, oh my word, you don't want to miss the videos that Stanley has put together for this week. They're going to be terrific. It is going to be such a good church service. We're, um, and, and then, like I said, potluck afterwards. So four please, string quartet. Yeah. They're, When's the got, last so time? You're going to have, it's, huh? it's, it's food and food, food and great music. So if there's um, a special someone that you've been wanting to ask out for dinner, this is a, like a yeah. low, this is low key, but also kind of upscale with the four string quartet. I, I think it's, I a good- also ask you to please bring enough food for yourself <laughs> and the other people that you're, you're bringing along with you that just so Absolutely. that we can feed everybody. Um, as I said on Sabbath, I haven't gotten to being able to multiply loaves and fishes yet, and I don't really want to try that out. So yeah, no. Um, so you know, bring enough for you and your family, but please do come. We really, yeah. this is a great opportunity to connect. We're also going to get to meet uh, Aubrey Taup, ooh, our ooh, new ooh, Children ooh. and Family Ministries pastor. Yay. She's fantastic. We just uh, had a great yeah, uh, awesome. first day on the job with her today. Mm-hmm. You're going to want to meet her. So so be there. Aubrey's the reason we're running tight on. So you can blame Aubrey when you see her be like, hey, I missed out on like a couple minutes of podcast because like you were here taking up their time. No. <laughs> what you do is you go up to Aubrey and you give her, she's a hugger. We found that out today. She's a hugger and she would love to get a hug from you. Just say, hey, Aubrey, welcome to Whole Life Church. We're so happy that you're here and trust us as staff. I think you're going to be loving the fact that Aubrey's here. Yes. Okay. Um... Was there anything else? I mean, I'm, 
We met this morning, but I'm just trying to remember if there was anything else we were supposed to talk about, but I don't think there was. I feel like that covers it. I feel like the potluck, because they put a ton of work into this potluck. Yes. And we, Max and Randy, were supposed to talk about potluck last week, but somehow we, well, we had we had tons of stuff. Every week there's stuff to talk about, but it should have been in a uh, another announcement, but it, it's been kind of everywhere. We're going to, you'll find another social media update on, uh, uh, as you hear it, watch for today you will see that and as a reminder but uh bring bring food Lots and of food. And bring a smile because let me tell you if you've never done potluck at whole life you've missed out on some serious international cuisine <laughs> the last potluck i literally was like i've never been so full in my life and there was still food it's because everyone just pitched in and brought a ton of food but it was just amazing there was so many good things like when you take a scoop of tw- like there's 12 scoops on a regular paper plate and you're like, oh, where did I get that scoop from? Which line did I go in? Because I think if there's some more, I'm going to go back after everyone's gone through and see if there's a little bit left. Oh, it was so good. Mm. And it was so good to have Melanie back. Yay. Yay. yay I'm and glad yay. to be back. I, I missed you guys. Did you? I did. Yeah. Well, yeah. we've missed you. Um, the podcast, you know, we we didn't have Justin because that just, you know, that didn't really work right. out. And I don't know how I didn't think of it earlier. But Freud was great. Freud did a great mm-hmm. job preaching and the podcast. Mm. Got lots of compliments on his message and his episode. So awesome. I think we can all breathe. Melanie's back. <sighs> I feel better already. <laughs> I, I came to work feeling better this morning already. I was like, oh, Melanie's going to be back today. Is she? I Well, I don't know. Although, and then, you know, if you all see Lynn... Melanie's mom. You see her and, and, and Rod sitting in the in the worship center, usually mm-hmm. in the center, left of center, if you're walking up to the stage, mm-hmm. five, ten rows back. Give her a big hug. She she worked her heart out. She came in and uh <laughs> she was stepped awesome. in and and did a lot of my my job for me while I was uh, busy working on other things. And my dad has been really awesome managing some major projects around my house. That is awesome. So what do you do with up good parents have, like that? I have right? awesome parents. You do. Yes. And so we've already, we've already kind of adopted Lynn here. Like she's already de facto staff. I mean, you're not going to find her on the website maybe. Um, but <laughs> we, you know, I, I just, it was just like, wow, how, how, how awesome is this that when you lose someone that does as much and does it as well as Melanie does. And then she, she stepped in and was just like, just asked all the right questions. Mm-hmm. Just she's a she's a hard worker, and think, she's a ton of fun to be around. Yeah, I think I'll keep her. Yeah, I would. I would. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, that's gonna do it for this week. But again, don't forget potluck. Bring the food, but come, come, come. Bring friends, and uh, you know, even if it means you know on Friday night, just stopping at Publix and you know getting a. Uh, getting some potato salad and some dinner rolls or you know whatever sure. whatever it is i mean we we're not picky we just would rather see you here and if a little food can come with you that's amazing feed them because ken i am not confident ken does anything with five loaves and, five two, loaves fishes. and two fishes yeah i don't i or don't a, know or a box of potato chips or anything else for that <laughs> matter it just i just nah, it's not his thing so let's not put him to it Well, let's not test it out this time. Maybe in the future. Maybe in the future. We'll see how it goes. All right. Thanks, guys, for listening. Have a great week.